So, um, like I was saying, um, from Right Games, I'm um, really happy to be here. It's an amazing experience. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something I call uh, holistic optimization. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, there's some similar things that I spoke about uh, yesterday morning, um, but it's more than just about programming. So, there's my mouse. So, optimization is the process of modifying a system to make some aspect of it work more efficiently or to use fewer resources. This is what we understand as optimizing something, making it a bit better with less. Holistic is to uh, address an entire system as the problem. Uh, all parts are connected and explicable only by reference to the whole system. So holistic optimization is looking at the entire system, not just a small part of it and making that fast. So in this context, we're talking about games. So I'm not talking just about speeding up one part of it, I'm talking about the entire process of making a game. So holistic optimization. It's the optimization of uh, the entire system. Uh, we're looking at frame rate, we're looking at development time is an important part of developing a game. If we can optimise that, we, we stand to make more money. Iteration time, how quickly can we change content within the game? Happiness, optimising for happiness. We all want to do something that we enjoy doing and be happy with it. We should be optimising for happiness for our developers. Anything that you can measure can be optimised. So the more things we can measure, the more we can optimise. So, you have an idea for a game. You've planned it all out, you know exactly what you want to go in it, you know how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, how it's going to sound. It'll be fantastic. They're all planned out. Then you start to develop it, and you have problems. Things are not quite as you expected them to be. And you end up with something a bit less than what you originally planned. So, performance, an interesting story about Space Invaders. Uh, you're familiar with the game, of course. You'll notice how, uh, as there are less invaders on the screen, it gets faster and faster. That wasn't intended. It was supposed to run at the same speed the whole time. The reason that it was slow was because there were so many aliens on screen that it ran slow. Then as you destroyed them, the processor was able to handle more. And so they ended up with this fantastic feature that's a fundamental part of the game by accident. Just an interesting segue. Um, so who's responsible for game performance? And who gets that joke? <laughs> I wasn't too sure with the context, with the, the culture here. But um, who's responsible for the performance of a game? Well, the programmers, obviously. They are responsible for the code. And everyone knows that the code is the stuff that is slow. They're responsible for the data and how it's being processed. Um, they are ultimately responsible for performance, right? When things are running slow, you get your programmers, you stick them in a room and you say, make it go fast. Well, it's more than just that. Artists are also responsible for performance, okay? Um, they are responsible for construction of the assets. So optimizing assets is an important part of uh, uh, performance optimization. So reducing the number of textures or the size of textures can have an impact on performance. The number of polygons in your models can have an impact on performance. The number of bones in a skinned model can have an impact on performance. Shaders, their complexity has an impact on performance. This is ultimately the responsibility of uh, a tech artist. They need to be aware of the impact of what they are building. You cannot just build a system and make it as pretty as you like without considering performance. Particle effects. Now, <laughs> League of Legends is all about particle effects. There's so many particle effects. There are more polygons than the particles than anything else. That is something that is ultimately responsible. The, the designers of the champions and are responsible for the art and everything, that's their job. So they can make the game run really slow by having too many things. Also, don't get me wrong, bad code can also make those things run really badly. View distance, how far can you see in the game? The further you can see, the more you have to render. So the slower it can be. Audio engineers are also responsible for performance. 
they, there's a memory footprint involved in uh, uh, the, the audio. Generally, it can be quite a large one. Optimizing is not just about the speed of the game, it's about how much memory it uses as well. There's a CPU cost involved in audio nowadays. You may want occlusion, so when you close a door, the sound changes. You walk behind a tree, the sound changes. There's a cost. Designers. That is a typical designer, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, they have a lot of impact on the performance of the game as well. Uh, the content per level, like what's in it, what can you see? Um, how many entities are on screen? The more things they want that are part of their design, th th there's a cost. Everything extra that's added to a scene has a cost. Uh, interaction between entities. Uh, how aware are they of, of, of each other? Uh, AI requirements, that can be huge. How com I mean, if you have an n-body system and each, syst each body within that is interacting with every other body, that, that can explode in cost very, very quickly. Fun is something that needs to be optimised for as well. If your game isn't fun, who's going to play it? You need, it needs to be fun as soon as possible so that more people will play it for longer. If it's, if it's bad to start off with, people will drop it. So optimization, everything there. Producers. Again, this is a typical producer. <laughs> um, producers are responsible for the development process. They, they oversee what's going on. They track what's happening. They make sure that team members can do their jobs efficiently. Uh, they are tracking things. They're looking at milestones. They're making sure that there's no stalls occurring for you need something to be ready by a particular time. They can ensure that all the different tasks are happening at the right time so that when the, 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 the requirements are needed, they're there. So that nobody's sitting around doing nothing. Um, scheduling is optimization. You, it, it, this is so much like programming. This is, is looking at what is required to do the next thing and how long it takes. It's, it, it's a breakdown of a frame. It's also what, what producers do. They are they're minimizing stalls, they're looking at resource contention. Again, programmers tend to do a lot of that. Uh, they're minimizing the time to the end of the project. It's like optimizing for frame rate. Um, they are effectively programming, but they're programming the developers. Uh, optimization is everyone's job, is my point. It's not just about improving the game's frame rate. It's uh, speeding up uh, tools. Th that's, that's fundamental. If you change a tree and you want to see a change in the game, how long does it take to get that tree out of your uh, content generation tool, Max or whatever you use, and get it into the game? The quicker you can do that, the quicker you can make the game. Uh, speeding up iteration time is another critical thing. You want to tweak the value of a character in your game, you need to be able to do it quickly. You don't want to change your value on a spreadsheet, export that, run some form of build process and then run your game which takes two minutes to load, play the game for half an hour to get to the point that you wanted to, to be able to test the thing and find out that it's broken and then do that whole thing again. Iteration time is critical and something that needs to be optimised for. Uh, speeding up the development of the game. The longer it takes to build a game, the more it costs. And so the less you're likely to make out of it. Um, within constraints. I mean, of course, releasing a game after two days and you can't play it, doesn't cost much to make it, but you're not going to make any money. So there's, there's trade-offs. Um, reducing memory footprint is another part of optimization we need to be considering. It's and, and so often neglected. Um, within League, we actually have reporting on the memory cost of the different champions at regular intervals. So we know when a texture that's too big is snuck into the build process and have blown out the, the, the memory that's required. It's allowed. Um, so why, why do we need to optimize? Well, mobile download size and storage affects profits. There are countries with bad internet. I'm sure you've heard of them. <laughs> and so a, 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 a gigabyte, Australia's the same, don't worry. <laughs> um, a gig, a, 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 an app which is a gig in size, you will think twice before downloading it. But if it's 50 meg, yeah, no worries. I'll grab that. So it has an impact. And this has been uh, measured. Web page load times, you know, it's not necessarily, yeah, but there are web pages, you know, online games and stuff. The time it takes to display the stuff you want, if it, 
that impacts the, visit, the visiting of that particular site. If it's slow to load, people get bored. Uh, VR frame rate's critical. <laughs> if you don't have a good frame rate for VR, you'll have people throwing up into their headsets. Battery life. Okay? If you have an inefficient mobile game, it's going to chew through that battery. Um, you need to be aware of that. Uh, fast game load times. You know, if, if a game takes too long to load, people get bored with it. But I think modern game players are spoilt, though. Uh, I remember playing a game on my Commodore 64 uh, back in the 80s. Um, uh, impossible Mission? 22 minutes to load. All right? You guys have got it easy. I used to get up in the morning, start the game loading, have my breakfast, have a shower, come back and wait, and then play for a little while before school. So, uh, again, why do we need to optimise? There's increasing consumer expectations. People don't want the same thing as they had before. They want more. They want better. They want shinier. They want faster. Um, so, if the consumer wants more, as developers, we want to give them more. Increasing developer skills and competition. All right? Now, as people, uh, uh, established developers like Insomniac, for instance, uh, produce games, they're getting better and better at it. And they're building incredible teams and producing incredible content that looks fantastic and plays fantastic. That becomes expected. That becomes the norm. So the rest of us have to try and keep up with that. All right? So the competition is increasing, as well as expectations from, from players. Um, if we optimise, we can actually improve, improve and maintain the player experience, which means that we can keep adding new things in and improving what's there and delivering that to, to, to our players. Uh, and their experience is better. The game may be fine running at 20 frames a second, but it's going to be better running at 30. Players will feel better about it. Um, and also improving and maintaining the developer experience. As a developer, if we can load faster, we feel better about it. Okay, we're maximising our happiness there as well. Um, often we're dealing with fixed platforms. We have a particular phone we're running on or a console that we're running on. And the expectations are increasing, but we need to deliver more. But the hardware's not changed, so we need to find a way of actually fitting things into that. So we need to optimise. Fixed platforms. Um, we have to keep delivering more. Uh, but often the hardware's not changing underneath it, as I mentioned. So um, over uh, the lifetime of a console, you know, five, ten years, the games that are released at the beginning of that cycle often are they're nice, they're cool. But then five, ten years later, what's being released is absolutely amazing as people have understood how the hardware works. Um, that, that's, that's, that's the Commodore 64. That's the good one. That's the one that had the 22-minute load time <laughs> from data set, not from disk. Um, so, you can't just get a faster PC to make your game run faster. That works in PC world, where you can build this incredible uh, bump map, gorgeous first person shooter and run it on hardware that costs a fortune so by the time you've finished the game, the rest of the world has machines that are fast enough to play it. Um, it's also, if you can run on lower spec hardware, you have a bigger player base potentially. I mean, League of Legends is a classic example of that we still have tens of millions of players that run Windows XP. Yeah, so we need to support that. So we need to keep optimising to, to allow those players to get um, the best performance possible. This is a game on the Atari 2600. Uh, the hardware for that was incredible. It was a 1.19 megahertz um, CPU. There's four kilobytes of external memory. Uh, you have 8K with bank switching. RAM was 128 bytes. <laughs> okay, that includes the frame buffer. So, in order to render anything on this, as the 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 the, uh, the electron beam, the raster beam, crossed from one side of the screen to the other, in the time it took to go from that side to this side, you had to fill out the frame buffer for the next line. Okay, you had 20 bits there to fill in, and the the screen was mirrored or repeated. And so you had to do it. And so this was a very hard machine to program for. But 
people that knew the hardware, that understood it, could build amazing things. This is on the same hardware, later in the life cycle, pitfall. Uh, David Crane wrote this, um, and it's, it, it looks so much better. There's moving sprites, there's characters, there's a, a rope. The, it's, he's managed to make this thing sing. He's maxed out the abilities of that particular hardware. So, fast forward to today, we have games like this. And they're doing the same thing. They are taking an incredible knowledge of the hardware, understanding how it works, and building games that work well with that, or building games in a way that works well with that hardware to produce quality games, beautiful looking games. So, frame rate. Generally, we'll talk about a bit of frame rate here. Uh, we want to aim for a consistent frame rate, generally. Uh, a frame rate that changes between 30 and 60 looks far jerkier than one that just runs at 30, okay? Um, and Insomniac, a while back, did a little bit of research and determined that a higher frame rate doesn't significantly affect sales or reviews of a game. So 60 frames a second or 30, there are people that say, I need my game to run at 60 or I will hate it, but it doesn't really affect the sales, okay? Uh, I think League may be an exception here because there are people that complain if their game's not running at 300 frames a second. Um, but then again, we do have professional players that are freaks and can do amazing things. Like, they are so quick, they can notice drops below frame rates that normal humans can't perceive. So I believe. Um, so budgeting performance. You have a frame. We have 33 milliseconds. So we start to fill it up with stuff that we need to do in order to make this game run. Uh, we check in some AI. We have some physics, uh, some rendering setup. Um, we have some audio, some game logic, throw in some particles. We have the GPU doing stuff as well. Uh, Z prepass, we have shadows, static scene, some transparent stuff, we have some UE. Beautiful. It's all working fine. But then we need to load. And we have networking to fit in there. And some fog, which is going to affect the GPU and depth of field, and anti-aliasing, and motion blur, and all sorts of different, and some clever stuff, and more characters. And we still have to fit all of this in there. All right? And, and some more physics. Oh, and more rendering. More lights. Better shaders. <laughs> <laughs> then the producer comes along and says, we need all that pretty stuff, but at 30. Make it happen. All right? But no, that's not what a producer should be saying. They should be saying, okay, art want 128 bones in each of the characters, up from 64, for example. Um, what's the impact of that? And, okay, I understand. Uh, I'll let them know. We'll negotiate. We'll figure out how we can do this. We'll work together on this. You know, producers are not your enemies. There was a time when everyone, oh, okay, people that I work with <laughs> hated producers. But, no, they are a very valuable resource. And a good producer makes a massive difference to a product. So, performance is an asset, okay? And it needs to be scheduled just like any other deliverable, okay? Your game needs to hit a certain memory footprint and a certain performance footprint. And work to maintain that and to achieve that needs to be scheduled. So there's a thing called the uh, Pareto Principle, and it states that uh, roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the cause. Named after an Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto, who observed that in 1906, 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. This applies to a lot of different things. Um, Microsoft noted that by fixing the top 20% of the most reported bugs, 80% of the errors and crashes would be eliminated. Um, which is why I ever fix 20% of my bugs. Uh, in computer graphics, uh, the Pareto principle um, is used for ray tracing. 20% of rays intersect with 80% of the geometry. It's a, a, an interesting common problem. So this maps well to code. Most of the problems will occur in a small amount of the code. Uh, same with design and art. There will be key things that are causing your performance problems. It's a matter of finding them. So we have fixed constraints for a game. There's a set amount of memory and a set amount of time per frame. Um, we need to fit our game within the set number of megabytes, within the set number of milliseconds. Um, and everyone needs to work within constraints in order to, to achieve that. Uh, unless you're very conservative in your game's requirements, uh, or you don't care about 
frame rate or memory footprint, you're going to have to optimise it sometime. If you don't have to optimise, you're probably not trying hard enough. So how can we tell what to optimise? Um, assume nothing. Don't assume because you feel that a piece of code or an asset is a problem that that is the problem. You need to actually measure it. You break it down. You need to have tools that allow you to, to, to uh, clearly measure the impact of different parts of your rendering, of your CPU, of, of all parts of your game, your loading. If you can measure it, you know exactly how long it takes and you can fix it. There's also comes down to things like compilation, iteration, exporting. Measuring those things is valuable because if you know how long they take, you can know where the slow parts are and you know the impact of improving those parts to make your, your, the process you know, faster and better. So there's a number of ways of measuring performance. Uh, external profiling tools. Um, the whole range of them that are useful. This is an old uh, PS3 one, which was awesome. Um, there are tools designed to, analyze, to help you analyze your games. Uh, it tells you where your time is going on the CPU, on the GPU, you can look at the amount of memory, where it's being used, how it's being used. Um, not a lot of people will use these though. They are, there's an extra barrier to entry. You need to run some process or do some form of compilation that's different in order to inspect this stuff, which is confusing to most people. It's still incredibly valuable for the experts that have to deal with this stuff. And then there's in-game profiling. Uh, stuff that's embedded inside the game that allows you to turn on things like this that gives you a detailed breakdown on where your problems are. Um, <laughs> the resolution on this is just crazy. Um, the, the, there are actually words there, not random speckles. So simple things like embedding uh, instrumented profiling, like from my talk yesterday morning, uh, will allow you to look at how long each individual part of the game is taking. This has multiple threads and impact on different threads and all sorts of incredible uh, detailed information. It's quite an old shot as well. We have a similar thing within um, uh, a League, um, but no one here is complex yet, but that will happen. Um, graphical display is nice. It has an impact on performance, um, still running, but you can extract that to a certain extent. And if, it's, if you can just turn it on when the game is running slow and see exactly where the problems are, it minimises the time it takes for you to get to that to start fixing it. Um, benefits of in-game profiling. Uh, it's trivial to see the, the, the performance bottlenecks when they actually occur. Um, you can output data about a certain part of it and you can then compare different builds and see how things have changed. Uh, even something as simple as a, f a graph of frame rate over a as deterministic as possible part of the game will allow you to see changes in code and impact of people's changes that's causing uh, a slowdown that could later on be very, very hard to find. It allows you to find things a little bit sooner. Um, it makes it easy to, to check problems as they arise rather than you know, a year later just before you ship. Um, log everything. This, this is so easy to do, but so few people do it. Um, not everyone looks at performance output. If you can log it uh, centrally, you can plot metrics on it. And if you can plot the metrics on it, like stuff like load times, frame rates, compilation times, asset build times, memory use. I think there's one more. Yes, everything. If you can plot this stuff and you can measure it, you can see trends in this data. And you can see which things are getting slower. And you can, you can actually start to surmise the impact of those individual bits. And you can measure what the benefit will be by applying some programmers or artists or whoever to fixing those problems. And you can also extrapolate from that how much money you will save by spending money now in order to fix those problems. But if you don't measure them, it's just, uh, it's slow because uh, he put something in it that was horrible. But if you measure it, you can fix it. So there's another form of optimization which is becoming more common. And it's something I, I deal with a bit now. And that's post-release optimization. So you've released the game. It's happening more with mobile as well. You release the game, that's not it. There was a time it would go gold master and you'd wash your hands of it, it's done. Now, yeah, you're patching it, you're fixing it, you're adding to it, you're improving it. So post-release optimization means you monitor the performance of the release title. So it's out there, people are playing it and you get feedback on their frame rates. And that allows you to make decisions on, okay, how can, where, who's suffering, who's having pain from the slow frame rates and, and, and can we help those people? 
uh, we can feed issues that exist back into the backlog and assign people to fix it, to, to improve things. Um, it catches hard to find performance issues. Uh, QA, given the number of different devices out, the number of different mobile devices, the number of different um, PC uh, architectures, um, there's no guarantee. You can't test all of them in a finite amount of time. So sometimes you need to be reactive and do the best you can to confirm that it's not an issue, release it, and then monitor and see if it is better or worse. And if it's worse, you can then start to address the problems on the hardware that has the problems as well. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it measures player experience as well. If the game's running at 10 frames a second, they're not having fun. It's horrible. But if it's running at 60 plus, you can say, oh, okay, that's good enough. So, how does one optimise? Uh, first, you find the bottleneck. We've got, we use the profilers. We figure out where the problem is, and then you determine the cause. That requires some level of expertise. Okay, it's not just, ah, oh, there's a problem. You need to know a bit more about the system. Um, and then you fix it. Easy. So how do you fix it? Well, there's a number of ways. You can look at the algorithm being used if we're looking at code. Um, can the code be executed over multiple frames? Does it need to be ready now? If it's AI, can we do 10 creatures now and 10 next frame? It's alternate them and, and interpolate positions and, and get away with good enough. You know, players probably won't notice. Games are all just smoke and mirrors. We lie to the players all the time. We provide an experience that looks like the real thing, but it's not. So we can cheat. We're allowed to. You can do less stuff. You know, instead of 100 entities, 80 might be enough. Um, use the hardware. Understand what you're running on. Make the most of it. Run it in parallel. We've got multiple threads. Even our phones have multiple threads. So we can run things in parallel, and we can delay execution, we can do all sorts of stuff in multiple threads. Uh, and don't forget, again, for building with code, compiler options. I can't mention it often enough. It is, if you don't, aren't applying appropriate uh, compiler options, if you haven't experimented with them, you may not be getting the best that the compiler can give to you. Fiddle with it. Um, uh, I notice a comment about optimization as well. They don't need to be hard to maintain. Um, some optimizations are very quite simple. Um, my talk yesterday morning pointed out a way of optimizing with very few code changes that makes quite dramatic perf uh, performance improvements. Um, but sometimes you will optimize code and produce some incredibly complex stuff because it needs to be complex. It is a complex problem. Um, and code like that can be quite brittle as well. But you need to make a decision, an educated decision, as to whether, um, oop, there's the feedback, told you. So is that, nope. Um, you need to make an educated decision as to, is it worth it? Do we need to have, are we going to risk the maintenance of this code um, uh, for performance? And there are cases where you will say, yes, you do need to do that. So when should you optimize? Well, it should be the last thing you do, right? Nah. -uh. Okay. This is uh, Don Luth in a paper about uh, effective use of go-tos. Um, he said, we should forget about small efficiencies, say, about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Now, people have different definitions of premature. Um, but then he says, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. So effectively what he's saying is, yeah, don't optimise it if you're not sure, but if you know you need to, do it. Okay? So I will talk about <coughs> mature optimization, which is optimising when you know it's time to optimise. So we have our frame down here that has a lot of stuff that we need to fit in. So in order to avoid that problem, I don't know where the feedback's coming from. Uh, in order to avoid the problem of uh, having too much stuff to fit in and no place to put it, the, 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 the optimization or the, the budgeting of performance should occur during design. You should have some idea of the cost of the things that you're going to put together. Memory cost, uh, performance cost, development cost. And then you make that part of the design so you can schedule in the things that you need to do. It should be continuously monitored and measured. Okay. 
if you're not measuring it, you don't know what's going on. It, humans are really bad at estimating things. Um, how many times has a programmer estimated how long will it take them to do a particular task and actually done it in that amount of time? Not me. Um, it should be done before, during and after development, actually looking at the performance of your stuff. Um, so there's premature optimization, there's mature optimization, and there's last ditch optimization. The last ditch optimization occurs at the end of the life cycle of the product. You have to deliver by this time. You have almost no time left, but you need to make it faster. The product depends on it. So there's three phases of optimization. There's code. Can we improve the algorithm? Can we, op can we optimize the code? Uh, we fix the obvious bottlenecks, but that becomes uh, rapidly diminishing. As we find the, the big fat bottlenecks, we fix those, and everything else gets really hard to fix. It becomes almost impossible. We're looking at uniformly slow code. Uh, I've seen that a lot where they fixed the obvious bottlenecks, but the slowness is just inherent in the entire design because they didn't consider the impact of their design in the first place, or they didn't know the requirements that were going to be required by the end of the product. Um, then asset optimization is the next phase. So we're looking at reducing textures and texture size, poly count, shader complexity, asset count, but that's a reduction in visual quality. So it's making the game a little bit worse. We don't really want to have to do that. Feature optimization, cutting the number of objects, cutting the number of enemies, cutting anything that's not critical to the game. Um, I, I worked on a, a game for uh, a, a company, uh, and it was a game on console, and they had built this amazing particle system that was, could do all this amazing stuff, and the artists love it. But it was so slow that at the end of the development cycle, in the last month, they had to cut the number of particles by a factor of five or six that decimated the particle systems because they were just too slow and they could not optimise them. They had three separate groups of, of programmers attempt to optimise that code but could not fix it. So I had to ship with less particles and that's not a good place to be in. I did fix it though. <laughs> but then the, the company got shut down and the game never released so... <laughs> Story of my life, it's happened three times. Um, so that re re ends up in a reduction in game quality. So all of this can be mitigated by early, mature, iterative optimization throughout the process of the game. Don't leave it to the last moment. There's a fourth stage of optimization, which I've just alluded to. When all the previous three stages have been exhausted and it's still not running fast enough, there is a very real chance of studio optimization, which means you optimize the studio. There's less people to work on it, there's less people to pay, or just shut the entire thing down. And that you don't want to be there. That's not good. Compilation times. Um, it's an important part of the development process, and that needs to be monitored and needs to be optimised. Uh, this was from... how many years ago? 2015. I put a request out on Twitter and said, how long does it take to build your, the, the code for your game? Okay. All right, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Hang on, we're still connected here. Sorry. So, uh, this was the response I got. Uh, we were looking at five to ten minutes for most, um, which was, was interesting. So, less than five minutes, less than a minute, uh, less than ten minutes, and a few that were just ridiculously long, which is not a good place to be in. I've worked on titles that have taken 45 minutes for a full rebuild. That's horrible. And it, this just this year, a couple of weeks before I came here, um, and got basically the same result. Most are uh, 10 minutes or less, 70%. Take 10 minutes or less to compile. I wish I could add more granularity in the poll, but Twitter wouldn't allow that. Um, now, I was talking to somebody about this, and they said, oh, that sounds like uh, Pixar's law of constancy of pain. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll Google that and find out what it is. Um, now, what this w was said was, um, well, one of the, the, the Pixar developers. So to get a decent first order approximation of the rendered time, just the final frames you see in the theatre, take the film's running time, multiply by 24 frames a second, and then multiply by roughly three hours per frame as an average. Though I can pretty much guarantee that there are a few shots with render times well worth eight, well, more than eight hours, and maybe a few under two, 
But when frames take longer than 48 to 72 hours, a team is called in to find a way to fix it. So 48 to 72 hours to render a single frame in a Pixar movie is considered too long and is painful. Okay, yes, awesome, let's turn that off. So I, I, whoa, shh, quiet. Okay, all right. I will say that the, the Pixar's law of constancy of pain, 10 minutes is the pain threshold for game compilation. When games take longer than 10 minutes to compile, it's considered too long and then people start to work on it. Now, 10 minutes is still a long time. Um, League of Legends compiles in less than 10 minutes. Um, this is a great XKD comic um, and has often been very true. When you are compiling, there's not much you can do. I mean, you, people that are well organized will, will move on to other things and do other things at the same time. But most people will go check their email or they'll go get a coffee or they'll go for a smoke or. At best, it, 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 it it's breaks your concentration, okay? So, if you consider a 10-minute compilation by 20 programmers, 20 times a day, there's 66 hours of compilation per day. So, actually assigning a person to be responsible for making sure that the game compiles fast is a saving, okay? It's an optimization of time. Um, and, and, and once you find some decent... The, there, are constant, the, the, there are patterns in, in bad compilation times. Once you identify those, you can educate the programmers and you can start to uh, minimize the time it takes. And it becomes a standard uh, practice as well. We don't do these sorts of things because they make the game compile slow and everybody hates that. So um, you can reduce it by uh, faster link times. Um, you know, faster hard drives make a difference. It's just a bit of money. Um, you can use Unity builds, which is you know, taking a number of files and, and turning them one big file and, and compiling with that, and that can help as well. Uh, edit and continue means you're not actually having to stop, get out and compile. You can just do it from within there. But you can't do that with every platform. Fast build is a great tool uh, which allows you to uh, do distributed builds and, and um, compile projects very, very quickly with a very simple, uh, well, better than makefile type syntax written by a friend of mine who's also an Aussie. Um, so, reducing compilation times minimizes interruptions. Um, quick compilation time will make your programmers much more effective. It cannot be underestimated. Um, so, uh, another thing we need to look at is... Uh, what time did I start? Half past. Okay, still got time. Um, tools. Tools for building a game are critical. There was a time when the most important part of the game was the engine, because that was the hardest to write. We're pretty good at making engines now. Tools are so important. Um, the content generation can become a bottleneck now because we have massive games. Um, so we need to have a way of allowing our artists and our designers to produce things as quickly as possible. So optimizing our tools is a critical point part of our, our game development as well. So having experienced people manage those tools, monitor, like I said, log everything. Monitor the time it takes to get the content from that into the game. Is, is valuable. So things to think about with your editor. How long does it take to change an asset and see that in the game? Uh, how long does it take to tweak a parameter, to uh, enter a new trigger zone? Um, Real-time update is the goal, really. If you can have your editor running and your game running, change something in the editor and see it change in game, perfect. Uh, you've reduced the iteration time down to seconds. That's a worthy goal. Um, do you have a like a, a, an export phase. I mean, the, the, the format that artists produce data is rarely the format that the computer wants it in in order to be effective. So generally you have to process those things in order to get them in a format that can run effectively. Um, instead of doing it all at once and then waiting for an hour, I actually worked on a game where there was a, um, a pass that had to be done to, to bake lighting into the game. Uh, and it took uh, over two days. So we did it on the weekends, and during the week, the uh, shadow maps got worse and worse as the content changed. Not a nice place to be. Um, a central server for build assets, you know, throwing more hardware at the problem is a viable solution if you have the money. Um, so the sooner you can see something in the game, the sooner you can fix it. 
Um, what measurement? Uh, measure and store metrics on export phase. You can see where your time is going, it's like I mentioned before. Uh, and then you can optimize it. Um, so responsibilities. The programmer, your code must work. Uh, no, it, it needs to be mostly correct. It needs to do what it's supposed to do. It has to be maintainable, particularly if you're dealing with an engine or code that we'll be using later on, or a product that has a longer life cycle and you're releasing patches and new content and DLC. It has to be maintainable. It needs to fit within the budget, and that's a budget of memory, performance. Um, there we go, memory and performance. Um, artists, again, your art must work. Oh, it's got to look good, right? Uh, it's got to be good enough anyway. It needs to be maintainable, fit within budget, memory, performance. There's a theme, right? Designers, work, doesn't be that, yeah, all these things. Everyone is dealing with this problem. They have the same requirements. They are all responsible for performance. So, a summary. Budget for memory and time use, which is not, time use is not just time within the game, um, process time, it's also time to create things, time to change things, time to iterate on things. Don't think just about the performance within the game, think of the performance around the game and of your developers. Uh, budget time to optimize and to maintain performance, okay? It will have to happen. If it doesn't happen that you require performance optimizations, you, why not? You're not trying hard enough. You, you can put more things in there. You can do more. To be perfectly honest, you can, and I know people that do this, will produce games that fit well within the constraints of the hardware that they're developing for. They have a clear vision of the game, and they can build what they want, and that works. But that's hard and requires a lot of experience. You are most likely to have to want to deal with, you will have to optimize in some way, shape, or form. Uh, design with performance in mind. Care and think about how long something will take to simulate, to render. Uh, think about how much memory it will use. Think about how you're going to maintain those budgets. How you're going to ensure that you don't check in a texture that's, that's too big. Um, I read about a, a, a game on the PlayStation 2 which didn't really have shaders, but somebody wrote a really cool shader system that, that would pass over the uh, particular geometry many, many times. And they had an issue with uh, a game running very slow at a particular view. And they tried to figure out what the problem was, so they, they profiled it, and they discovered that the eyeball on one of the characters was doing seven passes to produce a specular reflection, and the eyeball was pixels in size. You couldn't see it. Okay? So design with performance in mind, uh, but monitor it during the process as well. Um, because if you're not monitoring it, it'll get away from you. Uh, if you don't measure it, you can't optimize it. Measure everything. And that is the end of my talk. So, uh, do we have any questions? Yes? Okay, um, the question was how do you know when your game is optimized enough? Um, you set a goal. You want the game to run at 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second. You as the designer will choose what you think is right. You can play test as well and you can find out whether or not players think it's running fast enough and smoothly enough. But generally you'll pick a, a multiple of frame rates. 30 frames a second is generally enough for uh, quite a few games. 60 or more for some that are very twitch, very fast oriented. Um, but it's, it's like, how do you know when a particular piece of art is beautiful enough? Okay? It's, it's a, a, an intuitive judgment. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, those, b building a game like that on, on the older hardware, um, you had to be very aware of the abilities and limitations of the hardware to, to, to program within them. So um, 
having handling lots of polygons and doing, I'm assuming you're talking about um, uh, CPU transform and lighting before the GPUs were doing it. Um, it means having people that really understand assembly and being able to optimize the slowest part, which is the transform and, and, and um, uh, preparation of those verts to be rendered. So that is the, that's the 20% that we're talking about with the Pareto principle. That's the bit that runs the slowest. So you put a lot of effort into there and probably end up with brittle code. So it, it is highly tuned to work with data in a particular format. And so you make sure that the rest of the game feeds the data in in that format. It does it incredibly fast and very, very well and then pumps it out the other end in exactly the format you need. Um, it requires a lot of special talents and smart programmers to, to, to do something like that. Um, I can't say exactly how they did it because I, I, I don't know. Yes? These days, many AAA titles get out and released without any optimization at all. And uh, I want to ask you, how this curse occurred to our industry? Okay. I, I, I think that's probably a bit of a misstatement. There are optimizations that have occurred to get that game to that state. They may not be running as fast as you would like, okay? But uh, sometimes there is a hard deadline set for the release of a game. And you are doing all you can to get all the content to finish the level so that everything is in there. And so all the focus is on getting that. So this is the last ditch optimization that I was talking about. So getting all the stuff in there, and what's happened is the performance has been ignored. And nowadays, you can release a patch, which will address the optimization. So management has made a decision that getting the game released with all the features is the most important thing, rather than having the game not finished, but running fast enough. Okay, so you can see it does make financial sense to have the game released working, and then put all, your con all the focus on making it fast enough so then people enjoy it. But there is optimization that occurs. Don't, don't assume that they've ignored optimization the whole way through because that, I don't know a AAA title where they don't have people that understand performance. It is a hard problem to solve. It is something that needs to be dealt with constantly. And sometimes the requirements, you know, sometimes things funnel in at the last moment and all the content's coming in at the last moment and it, it doesn't quite fit. And that's a hard place to be in. Um, but yeah. Financial, they need to get the game out so it releases sooner than it should because they don't have a choice. Often it's contractual. A publisher says it has to release on this date or you don't get paid. So you put it out there because you want to get paid, all right, and you deal with it later. It does affect sales, but at least you're not, you know, you have a job still. Yes? It's okay, I can hear you. <laughs> did, did removing grave cigar help optimizing League of Legends? Um, no. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, Commodore 64. Because the Commodore 64, well, the question was uh, which operating system is more optimized for games? Um, they're all awful. <laughs> Consoles are better. Uh, you, you, the, OSs do a lots of things. They're not designed to make games. They are designed to run a whole lot of things at the same time. So one of the problems with uh, running a game on a PC or, or Windows, oh, sorry, uh, Mac or, or Linux, is that other things happening. You know, it's, it's worrying about printer drivers and, and, also, and checking emails and all sorts of other things are happening. So it's designed to do that well, okay? Um, uh, Mac's better at some stuff. Windows is better at some other stuff. It's a trade-off. I prefer the development environment on Windows over Mac, but Mac does some other things really well. So, yeah, it's it's not black and white. Okay, all right. Mike. So, Tony, I have a question about the sort of mature optimization phase that you were talking about. Yes. Uh, so one more. Trying to plan ahead a little bit. Uh, so, if you have something that has, say, an outsized impact, right? That's not obvious. I'm going to change it. That's a good point, and it's something I should have mentioned. Um, uh, it's important to provide 
um, tools to your content creators and designers that work with the levels to be able to measure the impact of their changes as they do them. So having a little meter when they're looking at a particle system in, in their particle system editor that says, uh, okay, this is taking 30% of the time you're allowed. Okay, that's fine. Or you've just changed one texture and it's 150. Say, like, oh, okay, I've done something wrong. If you don't have that, me that metric there, then it gets into the game. And that 150% may not be enough to make it noticeable. But a number of those together will cause problems eventually. So in the case of having a prefab that suddenly propagates through everything, it makes a massive difference. Um, the idea is to be able to identify that as a problem as soon as possible so we know what has caused it. Um, if we know that changing this will cause that, then at, at worst we can measure the impact that it will have and then try and determine, okay, how do we fix this? Can we fix this? Do we just eat it and, and optimize something else? Is that close enough? Yes? Uh, you mentioned that we should uh, constantly monitor the performance. Yes. How do you do that? Is it in a testing phase, or are you automating in the process? Uh, the question was, um, how do we measure performance all the time? Okay. Uh, yes, measure it in uh, QA. They should be aware of the frame rate changes. Um, automated testing is another way we can have um, measuring of that. But to me, that's a little bit late. I think that as a programmer, or an artist, or a designer is working on the product that the, 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 the section they're working on, that there should be a way of saying, okay, this is the impact of your changes. So as a programmer, you're, you're uh, changing some code, you can instrument that, and then you can look at, okay, before I started making my changes, it was taking two milliseconds. Now it's taking five milliseconds. I've made it worse. Is that within my budget? If so, fine, leave it. If it's not, then address with it. So a programmer, and that's a hard thing. Most programmers don't want to care about performance. They just want to make it work and do the next thing. But they have a budget that they should be um, uh, working within. So assuming that a programmer doesn't, isn't aware of the problem, maybe it's a spike that occurs in rare, rare conditions and they've, they've chest tested it. But in certain cases, something bizarre happens and it slows things down dramatically. That's when your QA needs to be able to highlight that as an issue. Or automatic testing will highlight that as an issue. Or at worst, it goes live, but you can get feedback from your um, post-release um, uh, uh, metrics. And say, ah, oh, okay, this is happening in certain cases. Let's try and find out what that is. But providing tools that allow your designers, your artists, and your programmers to see the, the impact of their changes as soon as possible is, is, is critical. Okay, last question. <laughs> if, if there are any uh, season one build of the Dome Legends, like the one of four uh, will uh, the game have worse? Sorry, what was the question? The difference between season one and seven. What was? Can you re repeat? If they run it on the same PC, yeah. Which one has better performance? The season one one. It's a good question. Uh, the question was, if you ran season one League of Legends on a particular PC and then ran season seven on that same one, which one would run better? Um, I honestly don't know. I'd be guessing. I'd like to know. I suspect that the season one one would be faster because uh, it was built for less requirements. It, it, it had less things happening in it. There were less champions. Poly models were less. But it was also not optimized as much. We now have a lot more in it. We have much larger textures. We have a lot more detail. We have champions that have incredible detail and more particle effects. So. How do you measure? The champions are different. They have different numbers of particle effects. Um, yeah. Um, I, I guess the earlier one would run faster because it's doing less, quite simply. Okay, uh, if anybody has any questions, come see me out, uh, outside and, and we can talk. Thank you.